Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. My videos on historic buildings just don't rank up the numbers. Data shows that if I want to attract the most number of views, I should stick with skyscrapers or Frank Lloyd Wright. I suppose to increase monetization, I should do videos only on Frank Lloyd Wright skyscrapers, except there are none, at least none built. Screw that. Hire Sophia is one of the greatest buildings ever built, and you should know about it regardless. Hagia Sophia, like the city of Constantinople in which it stands, changed human history in ways that few buildings have ever changed history. Hagia Sophia featured the highest, largest masonry dome over the largest single volume of space, unsurpassed for a thousand years. It was built in 537 AD by the Roman Emperor Justinian in Constantinople, the city also known as New Rome which the Emperor Constantine had established as the empire's capital 200 years earlier. The reason he placed the capital there is why the city, and Hagia Sophia, its greatest building, remained important for millennia. The three great continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, converge in the Middle East, and it remained the easiest land bridge among the human populations for tens of thousands of years. This is why so many different populations have fought over it. Constantine placed his capital at the old Greek city of Byzantium because it was the crossroads of the Roman Empire, which had expanded over a thousand years to encompass most of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. At this point, where Europe met Asia, the city was the physical center of the empire. From here, a chariot messenger dispatched could reach Gaul, Rome or Alexandria in about a month on the ubiquitous Roman road system. But it was also where the Mediterranean and Aegean Sea connected with the Sea of Marmara, which led to the Bosporus Strait. The Bosporus Waterway connected to the Black Sea, from which ships would have access to ports and cities almost 800 miles deeper into Asia. Indian and Chinese silks, spices, and other goods were prized in the West. For a thousand years, whoever controlled this city controlled the economic engine of the world. So it was, in fact, the looming loss of Constantinople to the Muslims in the 15th century that inspired the Portuguese to try to find a sea route to India and China. They began a program of many decades sailing along the African coast to see if the Atlantic Ocean was indeed connected to the Indian Ocean, and then to try to find India from there. In a desperate attempt to keep up with the Portuguese, the Spanish crown commissioned navigator Columbus to sail west in order to get east. And so yes, the looming fall of Constantinople had everything to do with Columbus finding America. Since the 1920s, the city has been known as Istanbul officially. This is a Turkish hearing of the Greek phrase Ice Ten Poland, meaning to the city. For many hundreds of years, the people referred to Constantinople simply as the city, the same way people around New York City, including in New Jersey, Connecticut, and all the way up into Massachusetts, referred to New York City as the city. But these days, it is Istanbul, not Constantinople. Istanbul is Constantinople now. It's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Been a long time gone. Constantinople, why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business about the Turks. When Rome was sacked in 410 AD, and the last emperor of the Western Empire, Romulus Augustus, was deposed in 476 AD, we tend to look at that as the end of the Roman Empire. But the empire in the East considered themselves the Roman Empire. It too had problems with Persians, but remained a stronghold holding on to much of the territory that today we would call Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. In 510 AD, the Roman Empire in the East entered a golden age with the ascension of Justin I 
and eventually even more so with his nephew Justinian I, who became emperor in 527 AD. Justinian was a Latin commoner who married Theodora, an actress with um, a bit of a history. But both together would lead the empire to greater power, ever expanding its territory into the lost lands of the Western Empire, including across North Africa and into Andalusia, Spain, and the Italia Peninsula, the boot of Italy, which was the heart of the original Roman Empire. The history of Constantinople is fraught with major riots by the mob, and Justinian faced that with the 532 AD Nica riots. Basically, it was caused by a bunch of rowdy, angry chariot race fans starting their fight at the Hippodrome. It soon spread throughout the city. Some reports say that about 30,000 people died that day, both from the mob and by the military force that Justinian ordered in order to crush the riot and restore order. Shortly after establishing this military peace, Justinian endeavored to rework Roman law with reforms we call the Code of Justinian, which expanded rights for women, codified damages with monetary retribution instead of violence, and much more. We might still find it kind of barbaric today, but in many ways it was a giant step forward for humanity. Justinian also engaged in a massive building program. This included defensive walls, aqueducts, and cisterns, which were expanded by his successors, and made Constantinople impenetrable by war or siege for over a thousand years, until the age of gunpowder. Being a civilized Roman required fresh water, about 250 gallons per person per day. Consider that the average American uses about 100 gallons per person per day you get the idea of the scope. But so the city would not be crippled during a siege should the enemy disable the aqueducts, the city also had an immense cistern system created below the city, which could, at its peak, hold over 21 million gallons of water. After the 532 fire from the Nica riots damaged the second iteration of the Christian church known as Hagia Sophia, meaning Holy Wisdom, Justinian ordered it to be torn down and a new one built. It was built in just six years, 532 to 537 AD. It involved over 10,000 workers. Its foundation of limestone was topped with bricks, employing the pinnacle technology of Byzantium. It was finished inside and out with marble from all over the empire, yellow and red marble from Africa, pink synodic marble from the modern Turkish town of Sohut solid porphyry columns from Helio-Egypt, and solid lavender marble columns from Rome itself. Over the centuries, it was adorned with mosaics, rich in gold and colored stones, depicting scenes from Christianity. It could hold 5,000 people inside, and that, for the most part, is the building that we see today. During its dedication, Justinian I could be heard to proclaim, Solomon, I have outdone you. This golden age ended with a plague from 541 to 549, spread by the naval commerce between the cities of the empire. The plague killed about 25% of the population of Byzantium, with about 5,000 people a day dying in the city of Constantinople alone. Eventually, 40% of that city would perish. Justinian survived the plague, but was scarred, and died himself decades later in 565 AD. The design of Hagia Sophia by Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Trails was unique in its approach and unparalleled in its scale. Churches in the East moved towards the Greek cross of Christ with even stems, vertical and horizontal. They also moved towards domes, dominating the centrally planned space. The dome, which represented the dome of the sky as described in the book of Genesis, was perfected during the early Roman Empire. But Hagia Sophia was different. It was a large rectangular space, albeit subdivided with an oval center unobscured by columns. The center oval was capped with two side masonry half domes on the east and the west, and the higher central masonry dome above. This central dome was the largest masonry dome 
at 100 feet in diameter with its base springing up from 130 feet above the ground. It was only surpassed at the time by the concrete Pantheon Dome, which is 142 feet in diameter, and ultimately in history by the 149 feet diameter Duomo in Florence, also a masonry dome built 900 years later. The dome at Hagia Sophia was the first to use the pendenter form, a complex geometry that converts the circular base of the dome into the four giant piers that carry the load. And this allowed the space below to read so much larger than the dome itself. And those surrounding galleries, which opened the space to be even larger, were capped with barrel vaults and roofs, providing additional mass as a buttress against the weight of the highest dome, helping to contain the structure. Nothing is perfect. But after three earthquakes, just 20 years later, the dome came crashing down to the ground. The rest of the structure was intact. So the dome was rebuilt, this time a little higher, so it did a better job of transferring the stresses into vertical loads. In part due to this and other unbalanced stresses, the dome has settled into a slightly oval shape, no longer a perfect circle. Over the next centuries, art and mosaics were added including the seraphim angels on each of the pendentives, spiritually supporting Constantinople the way the four pendentives structurally support the dome. Indeed, it was believed that Constantinople would not fall as a city as long as Hagia Sophia stood as a testament to the Christian faithful. So intertwined was their fate. The Madonna and Child mosaic on the east interior was added around the mid-800s and is now draped so it is not the focus of the daily Muslim prayer. The mosaic of Emperor Leo VI paying homage to Christ in the narthex is officially outside of the mosque and it remains visible today. That was added at around 900 AD. From the 10th century, there's also a mosaic of Mary presenting Christ to Constantine and Justinian. And since the 13th century, the upper gallery featured the beautiful Deus Mosaic of Christ with Mary and John the Baptist. And there are even more Christ and or Mary portraits with various emperors and empresses, not unlike the string of Pope mosaics in St. Paul's outside the walls of Rome. It is believed the underside of the dome once had a mosaic of Christ, but that has not been confirmed by archaeology. There's a lot more history in Constantinople that involves mobs, fires, sacking, earthquakes, schisms, revolutions, riots, crusades, and more. But slowly, the Byzantine Empire was shrinking as Islamic forces ate away at their territory, both in the Mideast and around the city and into the eastern portion of Europe to the north. Constantinople became isolated and poor and all that took its toll on Hagia Sophia. So in an effort to bulwark the city, they rebuilt Hagia Sophia around 1300 AD. But that renovation could not stop history's march. It is safe to say that during these thousand years, the dome of Hagia Sophia was as inspirational as the Roman Pantheon dome, particularly in the Eastern Empire. Even the onion domes of Russia can trace their lineage to Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia's architecture was so beautiful and so impressive that in 1453, when the city of Constantinople fell to Sultan Mehmed II and the Ottoman Turks, he preserved the building. Rather than declare it the work of infidel dogs and tear it down, instead he was inspired by her beauty to build a minaret, add some Islamic art, cover up some of the Christian graven images, and declared Hagia Sophia his personal mosque, his own spiritual consort, taking her like a captive slave as a spoil of war. This after he cleared out the 3,000 hacked bodies of those people who were killed who had gone to Hagia Sophia seeking sanctuary. And this after the three days of looting, ravaging, and rape that he permitted once the city was taken. Regardless, from that moment forward, Hagia Sophia, its form and its beauty, became the inspiration for hundreds, if not thousands, of mosques around the world. 
You'll find them in Istanbul, but you'll also find them in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Oman, Egypt, and elsewhere. Later on, the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Mejed I engaged Italian Swiss brother architects Gaspare and Giuseppe Fassate to perform a major renovation to the building in the mid 19th century. They put a tension chain around the dome and straightened columns. They exposed and cleaned many of the mosaics. Some were recovered for their protection. This is when the giant shields with Arabic calligraphy were added. They also even upped the now four minarets so they were the same height. The exterior was never restored to its original condition in the 6th century, which would have been faced with precious marbles. Instead, the Muslims surrounded the original church with many domed Islamic buildings, including places for ablation, ceremonial, and practical washing stations. Stucco covers much of the original Roman brickwork. The original entrance today displays the same unadorned brick, hinting back at the genius complexity of the original construction. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, the city was renamed Istanbul and Hagia Sophia was opened as a museum. After another renovation of the dome and mosaics, in 2020 it was rededicated as a mosque. Male and female visitors are still admitted for free between the calls to prayer and out of respect, as in all mosques and many temples, shoes must be removed. Part of me is happy that the building has returned to its original function as a house of God. Part of me wishes that was a Christian house. But that has a lot more to do with how we three Abrahamic religions have a hard time getting along, and nothing to do with the God that we share, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. After almost a lifetime of longing to see Hagia Sophia in person, it was interesting to deal with that moment when it finally arrived recently. Like the entrance to many great houses of worship, there was a slow transition from the noisy secular world into the spaces of increasing reverence. The long line in the great square transitioned quickly through a gate into an inner court. From there we went across a bridge of sorts over the remains of an earlier church into the first narthex, which, like the entrance, was bare brick, ruddy and powerful. In the second narthex, where Christian icon mosaics are still displayed and the finishes partially intact, we removed our shoes. And then the moment came, and I passed through the great central portal, and I was inside. I was not expecting an emotional moment such as breaking out in tears, and I didn't. Instead, I had a sense of accomplishment that I had kept a promise both to myself and to Hire Sophia, who waited patiently for me, specifically, for the last 1,500 years, even though I am just one of 3.3 million people who will visit her this year. She is a little worse for wear. Time has left its scars. Some parts are missing entirely. History has made its mark. And yet, it is easy to understand what is meant by Mother Church when you are inside of her, there is a different transcendent feeling. I walked around taking pictures and I did an inside sketch, but I wanted to linger and enjoy the space without worrying about documentation. Just before it officially closed to the public to get ready for noon prayer, there were only a few of us left inside, and there I could just sit and stare and absorb. Hagia Sophia is a testament to mankind's greatest aspirations to build gloriously and enduringly. And while the bones needed to be good for her to last these 1,500 years, it's her beauty that must captivate us to bring us back again and again, to restore her, to care for her, to nurture her. Like a human being, Hagia Sophia needs our love. I'm Michael Molinelli. And this is Architecture Codex.